Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're so happy to have Justice Cobbs here, and she's been gracious enough to come back after being here last week when uh, all of the Illinois Supreme Court uh, candidates were here in a forum. So we're happy to have her back today. And we get to just engage her legal career and her story to the bench uh, personally. She's going to spend some time uh, sharing her story and her career. And I think it's really important for students and the legal community to understand um, different paths to practicing law. Um, many of our students here are first generation. They come from backgrounds or families that may not have attorneys and they're figuring it out. And uh, Justice Cobbs has spent 30 years in the Illinois court system after um, starting a whole different career and starting in a whole different ar arena. And now she is uh, sitting on the Illinois appellate court. So we're so happy to have her here and have her, her share her story. So. Um, We'll just begin by just asking you about what do you think are some of the significant uh, paths that you took to um, where you are now and what your journey, how you would define your own journey? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, and the food smells wonderful. Uh, and I haven't had any yet, so save you some. Uh, if you're inclined to go back to second to third, just remember Justice Cobbs has not yet eaten. Uh, so save a little portion for me. It is my delight always to be in space where there are young folks who are beginning a journey or maybe continuing a journey that they might have scripted out or someone scripted out for them or they believe is the place or the, the direction that they want to take with their careers. Um, nothing warms my heart better than to be among individuals who are just at the precipice, just at the beginning uh, of their careers. And so thank you for having me. It's always great to come back to John Marshall. I know that I didn't graduate from here. We're not going to hold that against me today. Uh, I did graduate from Chicago, Kent, but my boss or my mentor, my judicial mentor, Charles E. Freeman, is a John Marshall grad. And so I claim ownership of John Marshall as well. Um, my path to the bench wasn't scripted. My path to becoming a lawyer wasn't scripted. It wasn't planned. It wasn't even thought about. Um, many, many years ago, before you guys were even thought about, uh, I was attending college undergraduate in Baltimore, Maryland. I went to a historically black college uh, there, uh, the Morgan State University, which I'm still proud to claim as my alma mater because I still think it's one of the greatest HBCUs in the country. Uh, and then subsequent to that, I obtained a master's a degree in social work. So I am a clinical social worker, uh, and I still utilize many of my social work skills even today as I sit on the bench and as I serve on committees and uh, any other work that I do, including my community service. So when I was coming up and traversing undergraduate school for African-American girls who look like me, there were certain careers that we were kind of like expected to pursue. We certainly were expected and perceived to be great teachers. Uh, we could do that. Uh, I still don't think I'm a teacher uh, that I can do that. We could be social workers. We could be uh, secretaries. We could be anything, but we certainly couldn't be doctors and lawyers. Um, those were not careers or career choices that were presented to us. Uh, I am actually one of nine children. My father was a Baptist pastor, and my mom was a high school educated bride. And she's 95 years young wow. uh, and living in Amazing. Maryland independently of all of us, made it very clear when my father passed that she wasn't moving out and we weren't moving in. Wow. Uh, and wow. we've honored that. And indeed, even if we were inclined not to honor it, she has the keys to the house. <laughs> so uh, she's still with me uh, even today, and uh, we talk frequently about you know, how she's doing, but she's quite independent, quite well. But I went to college uh, and got that undergraduate degree in sociology and then on to get that master's degree. First generation lawyer, there are no lawyers in my family, there are no judges in my family. There were no lawyers on my street, in my community, in my neighborhood. There were principals and teachers and janitors and uh, everything else you might think of, but nothing that came close to being a lawyer. If anybody in my neighborhood needed a lawyer, it's because their kid had gotten in trouble and the parents had to somehow find representation for them. Um, I didn't have a lot growing up, uh, and although I didn't have a lot growing up because I was number eight of nine, we nonetheless had plenty. 
Uh, and we had plenty of love, plenty of concern, plenty of pushing to get a degree, plenty of pushing to get educated, plenty of pushing to do and to be the best that you could be. So I was, um, in my opinion, the best social worker that I could be. I, I did that for about 10 years, uh, working with families and children who were allegedly abused and neglected. So uh, that work took me into the Maryland court system because whenever you are seeking to protect children or protect the rights of children, you don't get to do that just because you're a social worker. You have to go ask a judge about it. You have to go and advocate for that child or you have to go into court with that child and hope that child has the fortitude um, and the courage to talk to people about something that happened uh, in his or her life that isn't really pleasant to talk about because sometimes that child was the victim of uh, sexual abuse. But in any case, I would find myself talking to judges and I'd be you know, using all my social work skills. I was doing it, talking to them about childhood development and family dynamics and why this particular child couldn't possibly fabricate the story she was telling. Judge would look me dead in the eye and say, they don't look like child abusers to me. Now, that was a problem. And after a while, um, even though the, the, the response from members of the bench might be different, and some were more sympathetic than others, and some were more trusting of social workers than others, and their version of the facts, and some still could not understand why a child of a certain age could not simply relate that story or relate about that abuse. It was amazing to me. I thought, okay, they don't understand it in social work ease. Let me go get some legalese and talk to them. So, after that, I decided to get myself a law degree, and uh, it was my intent to go back into the field of child welfare uh, and to still do a lot of work with families and children. Well, that was my plan. Uh, my plan didn't work out, and I ended up taking a very different path, which leads me here. So I've said a lot, so you can stop me anytime you want, because nobody can tell my story better or more you know, extensively than yeah. I can, but we want to have a Q&A, so I'm, I'm here. Sure. So you say in your neighborhood, where did you grow up? So I don't know if anybody is from Maryland in this room. Okay. So in Maryland, there is a county called Howard County, and there is a nice little city there, Columbia, Maryland. So we sat right in between Baltimore and D.C. And yes, as a teenager, I had the best of all possible worlds because I could party in Baltimore just as easily as I could party in D.C. So I grew up in a small town in Howard County. It was a basically all black neighborhood. Um, everybody in my neighborhood, everybody that I knew, everybody that my parents knew, when we were growing up and I went to elementary school, were all black. So I went to an all black elementary school um, and we knew everybody in our neighborhood, we knew everybody in the school, everybody's parents knew everybody else's parents. You couldn't do anything wrong because you knew by the time you got home somebody called. Um, so you were good, you were good. Brown versus Board of Education got decided uh, soon or during my time in elementary school, which meant uh, that we were going to now go to integrated schools. So I ended up going to uh, a middle school, as we call it today. We called it junior high when I was coming. But middle school was integrated. There were maybe 10 African-American students in this integrated school. In elementary school, I was smart. I was an A, A minus student. I got to that middle school, and golly gee, teacher said, you don't know anything. Um, you're not very bright at all. In fact, you can't even write. Well, I went home and told my mother that the teacher in the middle school said I couldn't write. She was appalled. I begged her not to go because I was very much afraid of um, anything that might result um, because she went up and she challenged a white teacher. Well, my mother being my mother, and she's 95 now, she's still my mother and still has that same fight and tenacity, went to that school mm -hmm. and asked to see this writing that her now seventh grade child could not do. Well, the teacher presented the writing sample. It was not mine. Mm. It was some other student's writing sample that they had determined was mine, and because they were looking at somebody else's, they determined that I could not write. Well, that ended that little fiasco. We never had that issue again. But nevertheless, it was still very difficult coming through the public school system. Middle school was predominantly white. Um, high school was predominantly white. 
So even though me, uh, and I think I you know, would have been pretty good at it, I wanted to be a cheerleader, there were yeah. no black cheerleaders. Yeah. All the cheerleaders were white. So the black students got together and we formed what we called the pom-pom girls. And so we had our little uniforms and we had our little pom-poms and although we couldn't cheer, the principal would let us at least stay on the sideline and you know, make noise and you know, shake our pom-poms, but we were not cheerleaders because we were not permitted to, do, to be cheerleaders. Um, I was happy to graduate high school, but on my way, I met with my guidance counselor and I said, well, I've taken all these college prep courses and um, I'm ready to go to college and I want to look at what college is. And he looked me dead in the face and said, you're not college material. I went home and told my mama that too. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed I did. It's like, now wait a minute. I have done well as a college prep student. What do you mean? Um, he did not help. Uh, he would not help me apply for scholarships. He would not help me apply to schools. He did nothing. That's okay because my mama did and I did go to that historically black college that we talked about and I got student loans and I was able to graduate wow. and pay off those student loans, yeah. <laughs> which are nothing like you guys must be facing now because remember, that was some centuries ago. Um, <laughs> but I did go to college and uh, I did traverse that. But that experience um, in junior high school and in high school made me realize the importance of education, number one, because you can get through almost anything if you get that education and if you're persistent at it, if you're not deterred at it. I mean, I was frightened as a middle schooler because I just, you know, I was small and there weren't a lot of us there and, you know, the teachers weren't going to look like us and where, you know, maybe they were going to be unkind. So I was a little afraid of that. But um, I was absolutely um, anxious to get out of an integrated school because of the treatment and to get to that historically black college where all I had to focus on was academics. All I had to do was focus on studying, getting good grades. I never had to worry about you know, being treated unfairly just because of the color of my skin. I have two follow-up questions from that. One, the legal field is a predominantly white profession and you've been able to navigate it exceptionally well. And what would you say to students that might have apprehension about entering the legal field and wondering if they'll have support, wondering if they'll be able to, um, be able to show their work value and not be kind of judged by their appearances? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, persist and pursue. Don't ever, ever give up. Do you know, even though law was my second career, because it had not been in my career path, because there were no lawyers, no judges that I could relate to, I was apprehensive too. I thought even with a master's degree in, in social work, even with writing skills, research skills, having done enough really to be in a professional group of individuals, I nonetheless had apprehensions about law because it had not been something that was um, made available to me or that was offered to me as a career choice. But when I got to law school, and I was an adult when I got there, because it's my second career, I found students who looked just like me, and I found students who didn't look like me. And you learn that every black person isn't your friend, but every white person isn't your enemy. So you find individuals who um, are interested in pursuing a study, uh, interested in doing well in law school, and you make attachments, you make relationships with those individuals, and you find support in those individuals. And I'd have to say, law schools, I believe, are different um, from probably when Ida Platt came out. Ida Platt graduated from Chicago, Kent, some, you know, many moons ago, hundreds of years ago. But law schools are different. There are bosses, there are organizations, there are um, you know, faculty and, and staff that seek to do, to see, have their students do well in the law school because they, they have a record to present and they want to present that, you know, we've been able to attract these number of students and to retain them because retention is important. When I went to law school at Kent, there were seven of us who um, were accepted <laughs> as day students. The one of me graduated. Um, there were others in evening school, but it's gotten better. I believe it's gotten better. I believe that students who come in uh, do well in their first year. They are retained and they actually graduate with their class. So I would say, you know, find a connection, make a bond, ask every question you can, find anybody you can who will help, 
find mentors. You know, um, I'm happy to be here. And I think judges who look like me and judges who don't look like me are happy to mentor as well. Uh, I always encourage students, if you get my number and you can catch me, you can talk to me. Because uh, I'm happy to talk to you because we have so many experiences that are alike, more that are alike than are different. So find that person, pursue, persist, don't give up, don't let anybody deter you or de tell you you shouldn't chase that dream, because you can do it. Uh, I'm a clear example of that. I certainly thought it was gonna be tough, and it was. Being a 1L, oh Lord. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> being a 1L was nothing like being a, a graduate school student at the University of Maryland. It was like, what is this Socratic method business? <laughs> it's like, if I wanna answer a question, I'd raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, even as a professional, there's organizations that you can join as well. And mm -hmm. I know that you are part of the Illinois Judicial Council. So even outside of the law school environment, when you're professional, you, you would suggest joining groups that I you would. can find support. I would. You know, local bar associations are great. Cook County Bar Association is one of the oldest African-American bar associations in the country. And they are always uh, anxious, interested, available to help you, to talk to you. Don't forget balsas. Balsas are great. Uh, I was in balsa. I had a mentee, and I still talk to my mentor. Uh, you keep those connections throughout. But bar associations are great. There are student chapters or student sections of those that you can relate to, and they want to see you do well. Uh, even the Supreme Court has a commission on civility. And if any of you were at the beginning of the year, I know somebody came to the school and represented that they were from the Commission on Professionalism and they gave you an oath of civility. Uh, and they talked to you about the commission and what kinds of programs are available even through the Supreme Court's commission. Pursue that. Pursue bar associations, black women law associations, women's bar associations. Any bar association is interested in talking to students to make certain that your, your journey through law school is, um, is good, is a positive one. I'm gonna have a few more questions, but we're also gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so feel free to think about a few questions while I uh, ask them as well. I know that you were very persistent in transitioning uh, your legal career from your entry level position to further positions. And I know that we talked a little bit about how you handled rejection oh, yeah. and how you pursued. And one of the things that we're really trying to teach students is that level of resiliency, that level of grit, how you learn from um, no's, how you learn from challenges, how you learn from defeat. And if you could speak about how you transition, because often when you start at a certain level within the legal profession, people don't wanna give you a chance mm -hmm. in another, what seem as a higher status profession mm -hmm. or area of law. That's true. So I wasn't certain upon graduating law school that I wanted to work at anybody's law firm. Um, that had not been really part of my makeup, part of my DNA, but I know that students typically, uh, a lot of students, will have some notion either because they've grown up in a family of lawyers or they've seen people operating in the profession, that they would like to work in a firm, and that's great. I wasn't certain that that's what I wanted to do, but I certainly did apply to a lot of them. And I'm not a bad student, so you know, I, I can't say I was in the top 10%, but I deans listed enough. So I applied to a lot of law firms, oh, a lot of them. And I got all these nice letters back. They were always kind. They always said how great I was and how good my resume looked. And you know, they were rooting for me, but just not with their firm. OK, that's fine. So there were a lot of those. Uh, and I would just keep sending them and keep sending them. And in the meantime, now, I wasn't certain that that's what I even wanted to do. But I sent them anyway. But the rejections came. And it's easy to be discouraged by the rejections, uh, to think that maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I didn't you know, offer what they were really looking for, maybe there was something I should have said differently in my cover letter, maybe my resume needed to be dusted off a little bit and buffed up. Uh, it's easy to second guess yourself. And I, what I'm gonna suggest to you is get whatever technical assistance you need in, uh, in order to make your cover letter and your resume look its best look as appealing, give them that hook. Do that and attach whatever recommendations you have or, or state them in the body of your letter. Do that if you really in earnest want to pursue work in a law firm. And while I was disappointed with the number of rejections, it didn't deter me because it was like, well, I'll land someplace. 
uh, you know, somebody's got to notice that I have some kind of skills. After all, I did write a pretty good cover letter. I mean, there were no <laughs> grammatical errors in there. And the resume looked good because I have a husband who's an MBA and he looked the thing over. So um, that was all good. But I didn't land a job in a law firm. But the, the entity that didn't reject me was the Illinois Appellate Court. I hadn't thought about the Illinois Appellate Court. I hadn't thought about the courts at all. I didn't even know what the courts could even offer me to do. But I wrote to the uh, research division of the First District Appellate Court, and lo and behold, I got a, an interview. Went in for the interview. Uh, they had been looking at all this stuff that I had written and thought I wrote well. And I said, have you talked to my seventh grade teacher? Because she didn't think so. Um, but anyway, they accepted that. And I ended up working in the First District Appellate Court Research Division. Those are attorneys who write what are called Rule 23s, which are dispositions um, that the court will issue in the least complex cases on appeal, largely criminal cases. So I did that. I was doing that for about six months, minding my own business, trying to think about, now how do I get back to child welfare? Because I don't want to do this. Well, lo and behold, then I get a phone call from Justice Charles Freeman. That's the last person I wanted to hear from, because <laughs> I was still trying to figure out, now, where am I going and what do I want to do? But Justice Freeman had a vacancy uh, in one of his clerkships, and I want to tell you a little bit about that, too. He had a vacancy uh, in one of his two clerkships and said, I've been reading your Rule 23s. I've seen your resume. I like all of your experiences. You write well. You analyze well. I like your research. Will you come? Well, I had to think about it because my first encounter with him, I saw him sitting at the, standing at the uh, end of a hallway he had on boating shoes. And I thought, what kind of judge comes to work in boating shoes? <laughs> you know, this can't be good. But in any case, <laughs> I put all that aside, went and had a conversation with Justice Freeman. And in our conversation, which was so much not like an interview, uh, to my surprise and delight, we ended up finding so much more that we had in common than we could find that was different ended up accepting that clerkship with Justice Freeman. And what he did not tell me while we were interviewing was, oh, by the way, I'm running for the Illinois Supreme Court. <laughs> Had I known that, I'd have probably been even more scared <laughs> because, you know, it's like Illinois Supreme Court, oh my goodness. Um, but he was running for the Illinois Supreme Court. And as you know, he won. And John Marshall has much to be proud about for producing the first African-American male on our Illinois Supreme Court. And much to my surprise and delight again, he invited me to go with him to serve as his senior law clerk on the Supreme Court. There had not been any black justices and there certainly weren't any black law clerks. And there certainly wasn't a black senior law clerk. So it was like, okay, game one, I'm really scared. Really, really scared. <laughs> yeah. But I wanna say something too about yeah. uh, clerkships. When I went to Kent, not that they were trying to scare anybody, but there was this guy, I think he was kind of like supposed to scare you. Because he would tell you, you know, you look at the person next to you and, you know, you got that person might not be here when you graduate. And, you know, and if, you know, there are these things called judicial clerkships and, you know, you have to be in the top 10 percent of your class. Newsflash, I wasn't. And I was the senior judicial law clerk on the Illinois mm -hmm. Supreme Court for Justice Charles E. Freeman for seven and a half years. Yeah. I could do that work. I'm not telling you not to strive hard to be in the top 10 percent of your class. But if anybody tells you you can't possibly be a law clerk, that's not true. Here I am. I'm proof. I did it for seven and a half years. And I got to participate and to draft, to write, to research, to analyze some of the most complex issues decided by the Illinois Supreme Court, which are now the law of the state of Illinois. You can do it. You can do it. I hadn't thought about it. Didn't, didn't even know if I got up there to the Supreme Court and they come bringing me these guys. I said, what? <laughs> And if that wasn't bad enough, here are Justice Freeman's motions. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to review these. OK, all right. You can do it. And I know you can because I could. I did it. As apprehensive about all of it as I was, you could do it. Uh, and I remember saying to Justice Freeman, you don't want to take me. You, you must want somebody who graduated from like an Ivy League school somewhere to go up to the Supreme Court with you. And he looked me dead in the eye and said, no, I know you can do it. So I hope you have somebody who's looking you in the eye every time you have a doubt, who's telling you, no, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Even if that somebody is you, find the best mirror in your house. <laughs> Stand there and tell yourself, <laughs> you can do it, because yes. you can. Yes, yes. 
I want to leave time for some questions. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Okay. Uh -uh. Just. No. Okay. I think I can hear you. Hi. Hi. I had a question about your social work background. I have one as well. And I was curious how your social work background in a specific way influences what you do now. Because you mentioned that it did still influence your work. It does still in influence my work. Um, and it's probably more, more, it's probably been more apparent when I was in the circuit court than it is in the reviewing court. Because in the reviewing court, we don't necessarily get to have a um, attorneys present evidence or weigh credibility of witnesses or even evaluate for ourselves family dynamics or what might be going on. We get the cold record uh, on appeal. But in the circuit court in particular, and I sat in three high volume courtrooms. I sat in traffic, which all judges do. I sat in eviction court, high volume court, where you see a lot of litigants come in and they are self-represented. They don't come in with attorneys, either because they can't afford to. My goodness, if they could afford an attorney, they would have paid their rent. Uh, and debt collection court, where you see a lot of self-representatives, sure. self-represented litigants come in as well without attorneys. And it would just be um, interesting to me because I would be trying to hear uh, what went on uh, in the story. Uh, how did you get into this particular place yes. where you are now? What are your plans for how to get out? Now the attorneys would be standing there waiting for me to make a decision. And frankly, many times they would be annoyed because in the circuit court, and especially on high, in high volume courtrooms, some of those attorneys have to manage two or three courtrooms at the, time, at the same time, and the judge in the other courtroom is waiting for them. So they are trying to get through you know, every case that they have on you know, their call, and I'm trying to understand this litigant standing before me because it's important for me that I hear your story, I understand your story, I understand how you got to your story, before I can make a decision about how we're going to rule. And I understand that everybody's entitled. So the landlord's entitled to pay, but the tenant's also entitled to some respect and some deference and to have their story heard. So I'm going to spend time doing that. I'm going to hear it, and I'm going to parrot it back to you. And if it takes a little more time than the licensed attorney needs, well, that's kind of too bad. Because everybody has to have their day in court. And if you leave my courtroom and you feel like you haven't been heard, you may also feel like justice wasn't served. And that we can't afford. Because if you lose confidence in the courts, we've got a bigger problem. Nobody's going to follow the court's orders. So I use that. I thought I'd never get back to doing anything with uh, child welfare. But in 2002, um, serving, I'd left Justice Freeman and I'd gone to what is the administrative function or arm of the Supreme Court. Because most people don't understand, the Supreme Court does a tremendous amount of administrative work. They run the court system. They do all of that stuff. They hear cases, but they run the court system. So I left Justice Freeman at the time that he was Chief Justice because he needed someone in the administrative office who could tell him right. that doesn't make sense. He was the best boss ever. He never acted like he was the boss of me. <laughs> he would sometimes let me think I was the boss of him until, you know. But I went to the administrative office to work, and after about three years, uh, I got a call from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court that said, we would like for you to be the director of the Illinois courts. I'm like, okay, I'm way scared about that, but um, okie doke. Called Justice Freeman and said, Judge, I don't know if I can. And the words he said to me were, yes, you can. So I was the director of the Illinois courts working with the Supreme Court in running the court system. That gave me an opportunity to do something, again, with child welfare. So in 2006, I think it was, I hosted the first child welfare summit brought together uh, national speakers, brought together social workers, brought together chief circuit judges, brought together the Supreme Court, brought together lawyers, DCFS, all those people. We spent a week talking about how to ensure positive, effective, and efficient outcomes for children in the child welfare system who came into our court system. So I had a chance to kind of snatch it back for a little bit and to do some work with that still, even as the director. Now, I don't get as much opportunity to kind of like be as creative in the judiciary anymore because I'm not the director. But I still do some things. So I work with the homeless population out there in the Southland, and uh, we do a lot of work with my board, Lawyers Lend a Hand, 
and mentoring, uh, mentoring programs for at-risk youth. And then my happiest moment, even though it's my tiredest moment, every Tuesday, I tutor a young girl from Inglewood oh, wow. Montessori School. So we bring down uh, to the CBA, wherever we are, uh -huh. I'm challenged. We bring down from the Inglewood Montessori School every week about 45 children. Uh, and uh, I think I might be the only judge. We might have another judge, but we mentor, we uh, tutor those young children every Tuesday from 5.30 to 7. I say that to you because if you want to do it, Lawyers Lend a Hand is always looking for good tutors. Uh, and so lawyers come and they tutor and I tutor. I've been tutoring now for three and a half years. And my favorite story about the young lady that I tutor, uh, and I'll call her T to protect her, uh, her, her, her confidence. Um, when we first met, you know, you got to go through this testing thing, you know, and they're going to test you. What is she going to permit and what is she not? And we had all of those conversations and we always would talk about uh, what are you going to do? What are you thinking? What are your plans? What do you want to be when you grow up? T wanted to work at McDonald's. I thought that was fine. You know, she wanted to work somewhere. She wanted a job. That's good. Some kids say, you know, I don't want to do anything. She wanted to work at McDonald's. I said, well, why do you want to work at McDonald's? They have the best chicken McNuggets ever. <laughs> and if I work there, I can get them free. Yeah. Well, that was okay with me too, but three Maybe last year, year before, she now says to me, when I grow up, mm -hmm. I'm going to be like you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a judge, just like you. Yeah. And so, most well, of you may know that I'm running for Supreme Court. So I have all these billboards, because you got a campaign. So I have all these billboards out with my big old face on there, and Justice Cynthia Y. Cobbs for Supreme Court of Illinois. Well, one of these billboards is in Inglewood, where T lives. Mm. T came to tutoring one day and said, I saw your billboard. You must be famous. <laughs> it's like, no, T, I'm not famous. You know, I'm running for the Illinois Supreme Court. And now she wants to make sure she's at the swearing in. Yeah. That story is designed to do a couple things. Mm. One of them is, don't forget that when you get where you're going, reach back. Don't forget pull somebody with you, pour into a young person as best you can. You may not know what you're creating or what you're producing, but you're producing something marvelous, something wonderful. I delight, even in my tiredness on Tuesday evenings, I delight in sitting at the CBA with, <laughs> with T and working through fractions with her. What she hasn't figured out is I don't really know how to do fractions. <laughs> I really don't. So I have my smartphone, and she's working on the problem, and I'll say, let's see if you got that right. <laughs> she's clueless that I don't know fractions, and you better not tell her. <laughs> One of the things that I think law students sometimes have apprehensions about is what networking really means. And one of the things that you really talked about is not just mentorship, but sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And I believe that really happens through relationship. And networking done well should be about a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the qualities that law students should exhibit in that relationship is a willingness to learn, mm -hmm. to listen, and to follow directions. What, what do you look for when you are mentoring somebody in the legal profession, what kind of qualities do you look for in, the, in a student? First, have a teachable spirit. Mm -hmm. Don't come to me uh, if you already know it all, because <laughs> then you should be teaching me. Have a teachable spirit, and don't be afraid to risk. I was very much afraid of Justice Freeman. I, I, I just couldn't even imagine that someone of his stature would have any interest or any time to deal with me. and. I would keep my distance. That was me, that wasn't him. One day he simply asked me, why are you, and I said to him, it, it's not you, it's your stature, it's your title. All of us came from somewhere. I came from a family of nine children, no lawyers, no judges. And frankly, I was apprehensive about people who had those degrees and who wore those robes. They are just like this. They all came from somewhere. They all have personal struggles. They all have issues that they're dealing with, either before or then and maybe in the future. Networking is critical. Be in the room. If you see some bar association, a women's bar association, a black women's law association, Cook County Bar, whatever the bar association, if you see a bar association hosting an event, go. 
there's usually some fee that's reduced or waived or whatever, or find somebody that you can partner with and go. I went to um, an installation uh, program for the Chinese American Bar Association, and I was delighted. There were three Chinese American students who had driven up from Champaign and they just were so excited to be in the room with all of the lawyers and judges. And they work that room. Judges, lawyers, they will talk to you because why? We want to see you do well. You're coming. You've got next. We're going to soon see you as members of the practicing bar. These are people who hold jobs. These are people who can give you direction. These are people who can tell you how to traverse in the legal field. Don't just spend your time in the law school. I know it sucks up all the air. <laughs> I know it does because it sucked up all of mine. But if you can find the time to be at any kind of a reception that is being hosted by a bar association or any program where you think lawyers or judges are going to be, you will be surprised at how interested all of us are in talking to you and to hearing your story and to sharing ours with you and encouraging you because that's important. You're the next. You're the next generation. And so we want to be a help to you as much as we can. Any more questions from the audience? Okay. We still have a few more minutes. I have one more. Go ahead. So you mentioned Ida Platt and yeah. that she was an inspiration to you. And she was a first. And you've been many firsts <laughs> as well. Um, can you just explain a little bit about her and why she was an inspiration to you? So you hear a lot about Ida B. Wells, and I like her a lot too, but you hear, you hear some if you're a Chicago Kent grad about Ida Platt. So Ida Platt was actually the first African-American woman who graduated from Chicago Kent Law School. And she had to overcome, as you might imagine, in the 1800s, um, a lot of barriers, a lot of you know, setbacks in order to even attain that degree. So I like, to, I like knowing about that struggle because as a black woman, some of them I can identify with, even today. Do you know that when I became the director of the Illinois courts, the eighth const ranking constitutional officer in the judicial branch, someone walked up to me and said, so who's really going to run it? Mm. Well, I just turned around and I said, me? <laughs> there are still those, ki those kinds of challenges that exists for all of us for women, for black women, for women of other nationalities, other ethnic backgrounds. Um, but when you read somebody else's story and how they persisted nonetheless, how they had the courage to just press and push through because they had that determination, I become encouraged by that. I become um, motivated by that. I become the, oh yes I can girl, uh, like that. I'm running for the Illinois Supreme Court. I'm running to be the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court. I believe that I can do it. Now, do you think I haven't had some roadblocks along the way? Hmm. Let me just tell you. Wait your turn. You don't want to do that. You're not prepared for that. Well, who? Who, who is better prepared for it? You hear all that nonsense. You just have an Ida Platt moment and say, oh, yeah. I'm ready. I can. I've done this. I've done that. I'm prepared. I'm ready to go. The barriers are always going to be there. The obstacles are always going to be there. There's always either someone, you or someone else, who's going to be trying to get in your head, telling you what you can and can't do, what you shouldn't do, or how hard it's going to be. Girl. <laughs> yeah, girl. <laughs> we have one question. And I am looking for certain, certain things too. So it was a second career for me and I was really blessed to have a really great guy as my husband who really supported the notion of me pursuing that second career. Um, especially because he believed in what I wanted to do and he always encouraged that. We don't have children. We have godchildren. They're all grown. They might as well have been my children. <laughs> I'm just like, whew, still, just trying to tell you. But anyway, uh, we don't have children, but I had a very supportive and still have a very supportive husband. No children 
and we were, um, we, we both are from Maryland, so we were here in Illinois without some of the same kinds of pulls that you might have if you have family here in Illinois. You'll see when you're ready for the bar and somebody wants you to come home, it's like, I'm studying for the bar. No, can you come now? No, I'm studying for the bar. We didn't have any of that. Those distractors were not there for me. So balancing all of that was very easy. And I did not work um, when I went to law school. I was privileged because he was working and he liked me a whole lot. He paid for law school while, <laughs> you know, he bought the books and all that stuff. He even made me breakfast when I pulled in all night. I, I like that guy. He's, he's a really, really nice guy. So yeah, so I didn't have some of the same kinds of barriers or the same kind of pulls on me that some students might have when they're trying to juggle maybe if they're part-time and juggling work or uh, juggling a family. I was really fortunate and blessed not to have, have that. And because the family was away in Maryland, I didn't have those pulls or those tensions either. It was really me and Austin, who is my husband, who were here. And he was busy with his career and I was busy trying to make you know um, this law thing work. So I didn't have that. Now your second question was? Qualities for a law clerk that yeah. you look for. Mm -hmm. So you might imagine I've been one, and I'm, I'm always going to be one. I used to threaten Justice Freeman no matter wherever I went. If I want my law clerk position, I'm coming back. Because <laughs> um, I loved it. I loved being a law clerk. It is some of the most rewarding work that you can ever do. You learn so much law. You learn procedural law. You learn substantive law, and not just in one area of practice. That's the benefit that I think I always had over litigators is like, yep, you practice all right. How many areas of the law? Because I probably practice as a law clerk in 100. Um, absolute, absolute critical thinking. If you think you found the answer in five minutes, I know you didn't think critically through the issue. You can find case law to support almost anything you want to do. That's why we have majorities, dissents, and special concurrences, because somebody has thought about an issue in a lot of different ways, and they've committed their thoughts to writing. Um, but I can tell uh, when there's not been deep thinking or critical thinking, if you've not pulled back every layer in an issue until it becomes circular for you. If I can find an answer after you've given me a draft, I know you didn't dig. Um, and I'm pretty good at researching and writing because I still do it. But I look for that critical thinking. Obviously, I look for great, great writing skills. It's got to be clear. It can't be redundant. It can't be circular. There can't be grammatical errors. I do this thing that I created um, with law clerks as a senior law clerk in the Supreme Court. I was so afraid that you know, we would disappoint Justice Freeman. And that's great to think that you're going to disappoint your boss because you'll do even better. So I was very afraid I would disappoint him. What I did was I created a process where all the clerks would come together. I don't care who was writing. I don't care who was assigned to draft or research the case. Um, you would submit to me, the senior law clerk, your draft. I would review it, and then I would convene all of the clerks in the chambers. We would then review that draft opinion we would review it for its legal accuracy, whether the facts were accurately stated. We would review it for the legal analysis. We would review it for the practical outcome. We would review it for consistency with Justice Freeman's temperament and philosophy. And only after that review would that draft get to Justice Freeman. I do that with my law clerks now. That way, I know that three lawyers, as I use my secretary as a law clerk, because she's a lawyer, that way, I know that three attorneys who are just as smart as I am have looked at that legal issue, have weighed it out, have asked the questions, have offered some commentary, whether it's I agree, I don't agree, I think this is wrong, before it gets to me. I look for the ability for you to have a teachable spirit. If you come to my chambers and you think you're the smartest law clerk in the chambers, you're not the right law clerk for me. You can't. I think, work in a vacuum and produce the very best product. So yes, critical thinking, teachable spirit, the ability to write, research, and analyze. That's what I'm looking for. And because we're small, you, you got to get along. <laughs> you have to get along. I, I don't have time. I don't have time for that. You have to get along. And you can't have this pride of you know, authorship thing working. Because at the end of the day, Justice Cobbs delivered the opinion of the court. And it's got to be spot on. It just has to be. 
And, do, and you accept law clerks as well, student law clerks? For the past couple years, I've thrown my hat in the room to get like an extern or two. And I, I, it's interesting to me, I always get something from Kent. I never get anything from John We can Marshall. help with that. You well, you should. <laughs> we can help. You should, because I think that's valuable. I yeah. didn't get to do that um, before coming to work for the courts. I mean, I was kind of like, it was like trial by fire. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was doing a good job or not. I mean, I knew Justice Freeman was fine, and if yeah. you know, a majority accepted what he wrote, we were fine. But uh, I will get stuff from the U of I. I will get stuff from Chicago Kent. I've never gotten anything we're, from we're John gonna Marshall. We're going to work on that. <laughs> Oh, I see. I see. And you know, all it does Dean is. I, is right here. Thank you, Dean. I get this. Uh, I get from Kent. I get a letter from Vivian Gross, uh, um, uh, Professor Gross, and she sends you know this correspondence every year. It says if you want to have an extern, let me know, and uh, we always say yes, we do, and then we don't get them, but because they get sucked up. It's great work, and I would love to have. I would love to have it. You know. Um, I would do it. I'm going to always look out to see because that's a great way to help you. It's also a great way to demystify <laughs> what it's like to work for a judge. I'm kind of like what I am now, except for, you know, I'm, you know I want my work done. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not going to knock on your door every day, but I always tell my law clerks, it's like, I'm not going to ask you where that case is. I'm not going to ask you anything like that. I'm not going to ask you if you got it done. I said, but. If I come to your office and I say, so how are you doing on People versus Gregory? That's your cue to know that I think you should be done. <laughs> uh, and if you're not done, you need to figure out how to get done quickly. <laughs> um, work ethic is important. Mm. I work all the time. Mm. I work on weekends. I remember um, even in the appellate court and certainly in the Supreme Court, uh, I would be the clerk who would be there on the weekends. And Justice Freeman would say, what are you doing? I'm making certain because it's got to have or it will have this opinion was delivered by Justice Charles E. Freeman. And his law clerks had to be as on top of their game as Justice Freeman did. So, you know, I look for folks who are going to support me and who are going to have a strong work ethic and who don't mind putting in the time to produce a product. There are no nine to five jobs in law. I don't care where you go. I don't care what you're doing. There are none in law clerking. There are none. It's, it's until the job is done and well done. That's what it requires. If you want a nine to five job, uh, there might be a cannery or something. You could go and do something in, you know, a widget shop where they count stuff. But law, and the other thing is law clerks think all the time anyhow. You, you get the legal issue, you go home, you think you're finished for the day, it's still in there. It's rumbling around. It used to happen to me all the time. I go home, it's like, why in the world is J. Boone, City of Chicago versus J. Boone Lee in my head? Because I'm working on the analysis. Yeah. Even though I'm not at work, I'm working on the analysis. And that's how you develop that critical thinking, because you're sifting, you're shaking, you're, you're testing all the time. If this, then what? What if this? Why that? And you got to constantly ask those questions to get to the final product. Well, we have come to the close of our time. Thank you so much for what? joining we're us. What, we're done? <laughs> no, you're and, getting and If you didn't notice, I can talk a long time. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and speaking. <laughs>